Okay. So yes, on my yes, ear, we got Chris and Linda. I don't know where Arlene is, but we got Chris and Linda online. Oh yeah, we don't have Gail and Adam. I'm not sure why, but okay. See, hi to you guys in person. We got Audrey, we got Jan, we got Joan, we got Anna, we got Steve, okay. and we got Joe. You. Okay, <laughs> and then you got me. So here we are all together. Okay. Uh, Jan. Yes. Could you open us up with a word of prayer, please? Let's pray. Our Father, we give you thanks. Thanks for who you are. Thanks for the word that you have given us. And thank you for our teacher who is teaching us that word. We pray that you will go before him tonight and help us to enjoy and to just be very thankful that we have someone who can speak so well. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. So, I just realized I don't have my Bible here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, bad way to go. Yeah, it's been on the road all day today. <laughs> mm. I thought I knew where he went to work. Yes, Kathy. Chick fil A. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> he, has, he, has his, he has his own seat at Chick fil A. <laughs> okay, so let's turn in our Bibles to John. Good old John chapter 15. Okay, and remember this is our, our last Bible study. Next Wednesday we have the Ash Wednesday service at 7 p.m. that we're doing a conjunction, right here, doing that in conjunction with uh, Cherry Lane Church, okay? So it'll be us and Cherry Lane together. Neil's not coming for him, though. Pardon me? Neil's not coming no, Neola had, has their own Ash Wednesday thingy they're doing. You said something about maybe Neola or something. I, yeah, I talked to Paul. That we had a, a district pastors meeting here, and I talked to Paul, but they got a thing already put together. We're too, we're too rowdy for Right. <laughs> we're too rowdy for You are. Yes, yeah, maybe. Oh, there's Arlene. Hello, Arlene. Hello, hello. I'm oh. here. <laughs> All right, good to see you. Straight from Florida. So turn your Bible, turn your Bibles to John. The Gospel of John, chapter 15. Okay. So, as a way of, of kind of starting this here, so the Gospel of John is, does anyone know what makes the Gospel of John different from the other Gospels? Last one, yes. and I can't remember. Doesn't have virgin birth. Pardon me? No virgin birth. Well, that's true. It doesn't even have any of the birth thing. It just has the word made flesh. But <laughs> it's more ideological. Or I, it doesn't. It's not chronological. Telling this story, that story, but right. the idea behind because he groups things a lot differently bringing about an expected end. Right, so it, it's basically grouped by theological thoughts and ideas. So there, there's a, what? Yeah, there's the seven I am statements in it, the seven miracles in it, it but it, they're all grouped by, it's grouped by different theological type of ideas. And that's why there is a broad chronological sense in that yes the beginning of John we're at the beginning of Jesus's life and then yes Jesus goes to the cross and dies and has a resurrection but all the in-between stuff and the reason it never matches up with any of the other gospels is because things are grouped 
more by different theological ideas, our understanding of who Christ is, you know, and why Christ came, and then what our relationship is to Christ and how we believe in Jesus Christ, and then what we are supposed to do as disciples of Christ. There's your three broad themes. Here at the end, these last sets of chapters, 13 all the way through uh, 15, uh, 16, 17, excuse me, those four chapters, 13 through 17, are the longest set of words by Jesus in all of Scripture. It's bigger than the Sermon on the Mount. This is called the graduation address. And it's given at the Last Supper. In John, you never see the Last Supper given. You never hear about the bread and the wine or anything like that. They're in the upper room. He washes their feet. And then after washing their feet and sending Judas on his way, he goes into a big discussion as to what, he, what they are expected to do as disciples and what they're and those words are as important to us too as to what we're called to do as disciples of Christ. He also has Jesus' mother at the foot of the cross. I don't know the other gospels just say a Mary and a and he also has a John. And John. Yeah. So what are we to believe? Well <clears throat> Okay, now you get in. This is a different thing. All right, well, then we'll No, but this, no, this is a little different thing, and you're right. You take a look at the crucifixion and the resurrection stories in, in all four Gospels, and what you find is they're all four different ways of doing things. Okay? So then that leaves people who say, oh, it's all wrong. This doesn't make any sense. Who's right, who's wrong, and stuff like that. So, when the Pharisees, and just bear with me a moment, when the Pharisees were focusing on all these little details of things, you know, the law, what did Jesus tell them? That's not the important thing. missing people are important not the laws governing them right so now let me ask you in all four accounts does Jesus die on the cross in all four accounts does Jesus rise from the grave <laughs> hmm I wonder what's important <laughs> Well, I mostly I do because you know when I get my flannel board out and I say <laughs> they all ran away except John and here's his mother and and, and the thing is is you can say okay yep yeah, fine and some depict it yep yeah, there's the women huddled around at the cross watching obviously someone was watching it okay so maybe he was I and. And it makes sense. It's a motherly thing to do, you know, to be there. Um, that's okay. But that's not what's important. What's important. And that's the that's the real key thing. You know, okay, one accounts has a big old earthquake and the curtain in the temple being rent in two and everything like that. Yeah, it's symbolic now that we're all <laughs> You know, we can all go directly to God. There's no curtain standing between us. But still, the important thing is that Jesus died. Sins. Yeah. I mean, the one version, you know, has the tombs all yeah. being opened. I mean, that's kind of a, a scary one, you know. A bunch of zombies coming out. <laughs> no, they don't call them zombies. But I mean, gee, what? Okay. Well, some had better imaginations than others, I suppose. Well, and the, and the thing is, is here, here's, the, here's the real thing, too. The other big part is all of them can be correct. 
And one of the really good things is I can show you the Quran. I got a copy of the Quran in my office. I got a copy of Buddhist scriptures and Hindu scriptures in my office and stuff like that. And guess what? All their stuff is all perfect. Everything aligns nicely. There's no inconsistencies and stuff like that. It is one of the signs of validity of scripture that somewhere in its lengthy history of this Bible, people didn't go around and say, hey, we got to correct this. <laughs> Make all these line up perfectly. Because if that had happened, then all of a sudden we'd say, yeah, someone manipulated the text. Mm -hmm. So it is, I mean, it's okay. And the other ones don't bother saying really who was around at the cross. So very well, yeah, Mary was probably there, and maybe even the Apostle John. There's nothing to contradict that. And when one talks about one woman being out there, Mary Magdalene going to the tomb, and the other one talks about three women going to the tomb, well, it might be the one just focused on Mary Magdalene and not the other three. The other three still could have been there. Yeah, it's just just like three of us telling three or four of us telling the same story. We're all gonna parts that interest us most is what we're gonna emphasize most. Right. And the thing is it's still all it's inspired. Still all it's still all inspired by right. God. Right. It's still all inspired by God because the most important stuff is still coming through. That's never being lost. Great question. Right? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think. Uh, yes, I agree. Yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Audrey's going to get me with that. <laughs> okay. Any anybody anybody online have any thoughts or questions or comments? All right. So here we are. We are in this graduation address that Jesus is given. They call it the graduation address because it's his last, it's really his, his, his big final speech to the disciples as a group before he is arrested. And we come to this part in the God in chapter 15. So would someone read John chapter 15 verses and we might well let's just go through the whole thing uh, 15, 1 through 12 those 12 verses would someone just read that those 12 verses I am the true vine and my father is the gardener he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away in the withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit and show yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained in his love. I have told you this so that, you may, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Okay. So there we go. <clears throat> So now we have 
this whole vine metaphor going on here. Okay? And I don't have this on the sheet, but the literary structure of this is, is kind of interesting in that the first nine verses, um, Jesus is there and he's talking directly to them. You know, he's saying, you, me, everything like that. And then if you notice in verse, well, actually in verse 7, he, he begins to switch and he starts talking about my father glorified, you know, verse 8. So verse 7, I'm sorry, yeah, verses 1 through 6 is this real focus and then he talks about abiding and it will be done for you and then he, he switches to my father and there's that transition so in some commentaries you'll see it part as this being the metaphor in the beginning in this first seven verses with then the latter part being the explanation of the metaphor Now, the, the vineyard metaphor is one of the most used metaphor in all of Scripture. It is used very, very, very frequently. I, I have just, what I gave you on the sheet there is just a few examples of its use in the Old Testament. Um, and I spelled it wrong, I'm sorry, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5 is, is actually, it's called the Song of the Vineyard. And, and this metaphor was used so much in uh, Israel that they actually had a whole song about it, a whole hymn that Isaiah then kind of uses in that chapter 5 in the beginning and he changes it a little bit. But in that metaphor always, the vine is Israel. So in the metaphor, the way it's always used, and even in the parables where Christ is using it as a metaphor, the vine is Israel. God is the vineyard, the vine person, the, the vineyard person, you know, planting the vines and stuff. And so Israel is this vine, and typically in, in the Old Testament version, the branches are the different tribes of Israel. So in some non-biblical stuff, sometimes tribes would use it against other tribes. You see, you're all dried up. <laughs> you're not a fruitful <laughs> wife. That type of stuff. Now that's that's not in the Bible, but now one of the things though is the way this metaphor gets misused. So if you could just think of Old Testament time. How do you think the Jews would have used this metaphor? They are the vine. Israel is the great vine. To them, what would fruitful be? Do you think? A good harvest. Okay, good harvest itself, material, material wealth and possession. Yeah. Pride. Hmm? Pride, thinking that they are well. The pride special. is yes, we're the vine. We're the vine, by golly. God planted us. We're the vine, 
and yep, we're going to have all this great material possession and wealth. We're going to have all this good stuff. We, we be the important people, so whatever, whatever fruits produce has to be good because God's the one that planted it and God wouldn't plant anything bad. But then in the Old Testament, what we see is in the prophets how they then use the metaphor to criticize Israel, specifically for pride, specifically for focusing on material wealth, for specifically focusing on this idea that just because they're the people of God, anything they produce ought to be good. And what do the prophets, like in Isaiah, what do you think Isaiah calls them to? Well, he does later, but what he says is, what does God desire of you? Very famous verse. What does God desire of you? Walk humbly. Hmm? Walk humbly with your God. Right. He wants, not humble. He wants humility and justice. Not pride and arrogance. <laughs> Rend your heart, not your garments. And over and over again, that's what the focus is, that this fruit is something very different than what they're thinking of. And then even in the parables, when Christ is using all these different parables, and I list them there for you, where he talks about the vineyard, all Christ is doing there is he's actually repeating what Isaiah and Ezekiel says. Yeah, yeah. No, not in 15. I'm, I'm setting the stage for 15. I'm saying in the parables, when Jesus is using the vineyard in parables, and I got them listed there. So now we come to this. This final use in scripture and this is the final use in scripture of the vineyard metaphor okay and what does Christ say the very first words I am the vine yeah so it's no longer Israel is the vine he says I am the true vine I the true vine And, and that's really important because where he says truth in there, that word in the Greek is the only truth. There ain't any other. Theologically, that's important. That's another verse for us to understand that no, there aren't many different ways to God. There's only Christ. Christ is the only vine. It's very exclusionary. So now it shifts from being Israel being the vine to Christ being the vine. And notice then what he says. He talks about God being the vine grower. So it all fit in that first verse. It, it, it really sets the stage there. So God's the vine grower, Christ on the vine. And then the first thing he says is, yeah, go ahead, Steve. Well, wouldn't this clarify to the disciples? Uh, they're thinking that, yeah, Israel's part of the vine or the vine. And he's clarifying to them that he's the vine. So I'm thinking, you know, if he does, if he, if there's any doubt in the disciples' mind, he's contradicting the fact that uh, Israel was the divine, right. divine, and he's contradicting that. He's well, he's not contradicting it. 
He's just establishing that he's the oh, true that, that, yeah. Yeah. That's the word I should have used, what he's establishing. Yeah. yeah. He's just establishing. So he's not coming because Jesus used him in the parable. Okay. He, he played off of their own parable. Their, their own metaphor that they had used about the vine before, that Israel had used all through its history. And he just, you know, in his parables, he's saying, yeah, so what does the vine grower do when it's not producing any good fruit? Yeah, yeah, what does he, you know, he, he was slamming them right and left yeah. all the time. And they realized that that's one reason why they got mad at him. Mm -hmm. Here, though, he is showing that no I Jesus I'm the vine which would establish an authority too yeah well this is life is through me yeah you, get, you guys had it wrong all before it wasn't Israel it wasn't the chosen people being the vine God was always the vine and you were the branches off of God. You got it a little backwards thinking that you were the vine. The one providing life. You ain't the one providing life. <laughs> and never have been. Mm -hmm. And that's Jesus saying, I am the true vine. The only vine. And that's, that's the real important, that's one of the important parts there. That word true is very exclusionary. It means there ain't any other. Yeah. Does anywhere in the Old Testament tells us that Israel was the vine, or they just only did because they were the chosen? They always, people? they always saw themselves as oh. being the vine, oh, okay. and it became a metaphor. That was a big, you know, big deal when you're in a country where you're growing, you know, we have a lot of vineyards nowadays around here, you know, it seems like you can't go 10 miles without tripping over a new winery around here. Um, back then, that was the main, that was one of the main staple crops. It covered the area, but vineyards were big deals. And so, as part of their culture and heritage, they had adopted this, this vineyard metaphor that's used throughout them. And then the prophets used them later, though, used their own metaphor, their own songs, as a way of showing where they were going wrong. And that's why I was trying to establish, they always saw Israel as being the vine, God being the vine vineyard person and he planted the vine them he chose them and planted the vine and and then the branches were just the 12 tribes off of the chosen people he had a straight him out because this pertains to us now too the Gentiles. well it does yes and and the point is is that life was not coming from israel Life was coming from God, and Jesus is establishing that. And then notice the very next line, he removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he proves. Wow, big stuff there. So first, every branch that doesn't bear any fruit, that's nothing, he is taken away. Ooh, that, that's dripping with a lot of theological oomph in it. And then every, and, and then the next one is just as important. Every branch that is bearing fruit, he prunes. And, and the big focus here is on every, every. What does pruning mean? Ouch. <laughs> yeah, he's trimming. He's trimming it back. Every single, every single. There ain't no one excluded. No good Christian who's producing a lot of fruits excluded from getting pruned. <laughs> Wow. 
Wow. Hmm. That's 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 love. And why does why does the the vine keeper prune? What's the purpose of pruning? fruitful vine. Produce more food. Yeah, produce more, even more than it did before. Oh, it takes more, yeah. Yeah, so the first pur the purpose isn't to punish, the purpose is to build up, to make it even more fruitful. But we you really need to, you know, us faithful Christians, us who are really in Christ and trying to be all fruitful and doing fruitful things, we got to take a look at that and say, gee golly whiz, God's going to prune us. Just getting us to do things that we wouldn't normally do or go yeah. out of our, our comfort zone to do things. That's all. That's not, right. I don't see it. So there's been, a, there's been a whole lot of debate, discussion as to what pruning means. You know, does it mean hard times? Does it mean discipline? Or does it mean that, gee, you produce some fruit, but then that might be taken away and it goes on then to other fruit? You know, a whole... All of the above. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe well, all of the above. We don't, you know, it, there's no real clear sense in it. Later on in the New Testament, uh, they'll talk uh, Paul will talk about that those who the Lord loves, he disciplines. So, pruning also gives direction. Because if, if, if mm -hmm. you have a dead branch and stuff on the bottom, you prune it and it grows, it grows up. That's giving it direction too, right? Well, the dead branches are just cut off and tossed. Yeah. Down in the fire. Right. But you're also you're also pruning it so that you can get either a shape if you made, have a hedge and stuff and you prune that hedge, it's gonna give it direction. This ain't a head, this was a finger. Think okay. that great but branch. Right, right. But the branch was yeah. 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 yeah, that's why I that's why I gave you a picture of yeah. the thing. Yeah. Where's yeah. the crayon? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can add crayons, yeah. You know, so you if you want to see a real one, you can go up to Mountain View Vineyard. That's all the right, closest around here. They got oh. tons of them. You drive along there, Waters Road, you can see a bunch of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, and my Bible says yeah. um, the Greek for prunes also means clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, some do see it as kind of a thing of refinement. And they associate the idea with the walk, the sanctification process that we get more closer and closer to Christ and grow in Christ. So we're kind of refined, our impurities are refined out and stuff as we grow closer and closer in Christ. Yeah. All those things are associated with this concept of pruning. It isn't just one, one way of looking at it. Now, here's one of the things though. When you look at this and you go over all of it, and you take it as a whole, this idea of abiding in Christ. You know, whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, so we get to this whole concept then as what is abiding? Because obviously abiding is the branch staying with the vine and drawing its nutrients and everything from the vine and living and producing the fruit. So then the question becomes, okay, well, what does it mean for us to be abiding in Christ? Faith. Be faith. Have faith in Christ. Okay. All right. Having faith. What else? Attachment. Hmm? Attachment. Attach 
attachment to Christ. And then for, for us here, you know, yes, you can have faith. It's in the heart and everything. And that's, that is really the important thing. And that's the way of being attached. But we are kind of physical beings here and now and stuff. And so we, we really want to know what, well, what does that mean? Really, you know, okay, we love you, God, but am I just going to sit here and say, I love you, God, and do nothing? No, and that's obedience and service. Okay, obedience and service. And you see, so Christ answers this question, though, because it's the same question the disciples have. So right here in these portions of the scripture we read, he, we read that. He says, if you abide in me, verse 7, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. What are his words? Love one another. Well, we're not there that oh. far yet. <laughs> what are his words? Scripture. Yeah, yeah. his teachings. And that's why we need to fight this and sort it out. Yeah, his teachings, what Christ's teachings are. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, there are some, there are some theologians that say, you see, because of what Christ says here, this is why we as Christians should always focus on the New Testament part and primarily the Gospels. And they actually make their whole focus in that area. Others say, well, because Christ is God and you believe in the pre-incarnated Christ appearing to Abraham and having other appearances with them that, that applies to other parts of scripture too and that's just as important I'm just giving you ways that people look at it okay but the main thing is is he's talking about his teachings and us focusing on his teachings not our own, not our own words and thoughts, not like the Pharisees, not go off and make 10,000 rules that aren't in scripture and say, gee, we're following them. But to focus on his teachings, that's a way of physically abiding in him. And then he gives us this thing of commandments if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That's a neat sentence. So his words, his teachings, and then his commandments. So what are his commandments? God love your neighbor yeah he, he did say those were the two greatest commandments if you go through his teachings you can see different parts where he says this is what God wants us to do you know, this is what we are to do and one of them is the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul you love your neighbor as yourself He also judge not, lest you be judged. The Sermon on the Mount contains many different commandments through him. Commandments are different than teachings in that commandments are direct. Do X. We have the Ten Commandments. So they're directive. They are commands. Okay. So that's that's why there's the differentiation here between just his teachings, blessed are the meek, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's a teaching. The parables are teaching. Let the little children come to me. Versus commandments where he specifically says, do not or do this. Where it's very direct.
should the te should the teacher teachings be as the commandments? Teachings are are just as important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Commandments though are do, do. I am actually commanding you to do this. Okay. So I may teach you that two plus two equals four. Not five. That is true. Okay. 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 But then I may command you to go do, I don't know, go open that door. <laughs> so I am directing you to open that door. Oh, you're going to go close that door. Okay. Go close that door. <laughs> See, she just did what I commanded. And then teachings are choices. Well, it's not necessarily a choice. It is all. It 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 can still be a statement of truth, but it's not a declarative command to you. So, like teaching is more subjective. Like you're going to teach us something, and we're all going to come out of here with something a little different. But if you say come to church on Sunday, that's a command. Then we have to follow. It. Right. I may say to you, blessed be the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right. Now, I'm not commanding you to be poor in spirit, but I am saying that those who are humble and recognize their spiritual poverty, they are blessed in heaven. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Well, and I'm always surprised, you know, when they teach a lesson, what some children will remember and others will remember. Oh, yes. Yeah. So. Gee, tell me that. I'm surprised every time I give a sermon what people <laughs> pick up and remember. <laughs> Yeah, and that's where, yeah. Half the time I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to think, are they on the same sermon I was given? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> they are some totally different. <laughs> well, at least they learned something. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so when Jesus left the earth and he commanded his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's a commandment to go make disciples. Yeah, buy your ticket for China. China? <laughs> <laughs> what, are what are you shot? That's a commandment we all have. You know, and right there is the clear, clearest mission for the church. Oh, okay. To go make disciples. That is one thing. One thing I wholeheartedly support in the United Methodist Church, and it's the best mission statement I think of any denomination is our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Yeah, I wish we had the enthusiasm of the witness. Huh? I said I wish we had the enthusiasm of the church to hold the witness. Well I'm just I'm just saying that that, that enthusiasm is <laughs> gee, gee golly whiz, that's what the Bible calls us to do, you know? And that's what Christ calls us to do. So there's, there's a very good, that's a great mission statement. I'm all for that. We're, we're to make disciples and, and we'll build disciples. That's, that's our whole thing. You cut everything else out, that's the bottom line of what we're supposed to be doing. So then we get to this neat verse here, and I want to... In the, so in the mix there between the teachings and the commandments, notice what it says there in verse 7. Ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. When you make of that, some prosperity preachers really like that one. I know they do. I, well, that's that's and that's what I'm getting to here. This is a real big theological area. What do you make of that? Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Well, you could see people who are new Christians reading that, 
and asking for stuff and never getting it instead of thinking, well, I'm not going to be a Christian. That, those words aren't true. That's why yeah. we need disciples. We can't just leave them to the board and walk away from them. We gotta... Well, I don't think they read the whole Bible because God, Jesus taught, he said, according to my Father's will. So it's not his will for you to have a million dollars or a Mercedes or anything else. You're not going to get it. You can pray for it all you want. Ah, but don't say, that's not what this verse says. And so therefore, if you ask something that you wish for and you don't receive it, that means you're not abiding in Christ. Well, then I want to vote. Because if you vote. abide you in him, him that's what you wish. It will be given to you. Right? Or mm -hmm. ask in well, Jesus' <laughs> name. There's another in here, too. Ask in Jesus' name, and it will be given to you. So what are you making that? It ain't going to happen. Well, again, you have to be humble. You know, are we going to ask? Okay, so if we humbly ask him, it will be given to us. Well, yeah. Well, then you look back and say, look at the way Jesus taught them to pray when he taught them the Lord's Prayer. But if I will be done as on earth as it is in heaven. So are you going to ask for something that... Well, then why didn't Jesus include that little caveat here? <laughs> that has to be, like you said, according to God's will. But Jesus didn't have that caveat here. You can read the scripture. Well, Scripture's John's infallible. It's John's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Paul that said that you ask a miss when you pray? I think like, there's a big scripture somewhere along the. But I ain't talking about Paul. I'm talking about Jesus oh, here. <laughs> I love him. Jesus also said, "Don't worry about what you wear and what you're going to eat." That's so, right. You know, so. That's right. Yeah, but that's Jesus, not what that, that's I'm not what abiding that in Him, and I'm wishing so, for that's something. That's why we gotta we gotta know the scripture. We can't just pick things out the way we want them. Well. Here, okay, let me give you okay, something, okay? <laughs> Unless anybody online want to jump in here? Oh, you when you're shaking her head. Yeah, oh, yeah, Chris, what do you got to say about that? Yeah. Yeah. Arlene's just <laughs> laughing at everybody. Yeah. So, you've got to produce fruit to be able to ask. Okay, so if, if we're producing fruit, then that means... Uh, we're good to go. We can we can ask whatever we wish, and God will give it to us. All right, new boat. Good, good That's what the pros hey, the prosperity yeah. gospel people, okay, and and I might add, Pentecostalish that are just kind of borderish, yeah, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Um, borderish uh, prosperity gospel people. <laughs> they will tell you that yeah. And if you ask for it and don't receive it, well, you you just ain't abiding. You don't have the faith. Okay, it says I command you to love one another. So then if we love one another and ask in his name. <laughs> and now here's where I'm going to hopefully clarify this whole dilemma. Okay. This is a point where in interpretation... You really need to look at the Greek word and what's being said. And so in the Greek, okay, and if you flip over, in the Greek, what gets translated rather imperfectly into English as wish or want is perfect and best. And the done for you will be brought to pass. Would be the. <coughs> so, a better translation to get the concept across <coughs> is if you're abiding in Christ, God will bring to pass what's best for you. you will have the perfect outcome in Christ. That's right for you. 
Not that God, some magic genie that you rub and you get what you wish for. See how all of a sudden, theologically, it becomes a whole different meaning? So that would be a very good translation. No. The way they put well, the problem is, is, is there's always been a dilemma on how to translate that. And in, in English, in so many different ways, it doesn't translate Greek well, like the word love. Well, in Greek, it's seven different ways of the word love that all translates to one English word. And conceptually, those seven things mean totally different things, but every time you see it in the Bible, it's always just the word love. And that, that can create problems there. And unless you, you put it in the entire context of this, of this passage, and you really look at the Greek words being used and what their full meaning is, you can often miss that. This is one of the dangers, and I just say this, and I know, so this, this might just be a Weberism <laughs> for what it's worth. So a Weberism means you can toss out if you don't like it, you know. <laughs> but to me, one of the dangers of the type of Bible studies and things like that where everyone just reads it and then spout off what they think it means to them is that's not really a good study. That's just kind of a subjective <clears throat> sharing. Yes, yeah, a subjective sharing kind of thing going on. It's not really studying and getting into the Word. There is a specific kind of meaning that is in scripture that's supposed to come across that that's the whole point of the message it's like if you write a letter or write something down you have a certain intent you're trying to get across and communicate to people and there is a singular type of message in scripture of Jesus Christ and we run a risk that we lose that when we're just kind of saying, yeah, here's what I think. So when Jesus was saying these things, he was using the proper term for love in that situation that he wanted to. So oh, yeah. How, so how did, we mix, how did we mess this up so bad? That's just well, love. Jesus, what language did Jesus speak? Aramaic. Aramaic. Yeah. What is Aramaic? Combination. combination of Hebrew and what was spoke in Persia. And so it's this mixture of all that with a little bit of Greek thrown in the whole way to really make it confusing. Um, so he's speaking that. Then what happens is it gets written down because the language of writing throughout the Roman world was Greek. So Matthew messed it up when he wrote it down. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it gets translated in, you know, that's what it gets written down to. Now they're inspired by God, they're writing the right words. It's then in our translation, we don't have seven different words for love. Okay, you wrote love. Great. And there were some concepts in Christianity, such as abiding in Christ with the early disciples, that to them was almost common sense as to what it means. No one in early Christianity thought of Christ as some magic genie and if, oh, if we abide in him, we can just wish whatever we want and we'll get it. 
Yeah, right. They would have wished for the Roman Empire to go away and for them persecutions to stop. I mean, they didn't think that way. They understood the idea was, as we are in Christ, God will perfect us and make us whole. The thing we were meant to be in, in God. And so that was just perfectly understood. It gets lost with us English people and Americans later on, and then we converted into this whole prosperity gospel garbage. And that's, but that's the problem with kind of mistranslating, misinterpreting, and not doing a proper study of things. It can lead to those kind of conclusions and go on off in the deep end. So, and then we notice his commandment. And we go, we've got a few minutes left here. Then we notice his, his commandment. He gives the, this new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. And the love that's used there is agape love. That's hard. That's hard. To love others as he has loved us. Because he died for us. How many of us will die right. for someone else? Right. But that, it is that sacrificial love. And so we are commanded to love each other in that manner. And it's not just love each Christian, other Christians in that manner. It's the other is a generalized term, meaning all people. So when Christ said, love your enemies, he also was saying agape love for your enemies. Like love the unlovable. Yeah, like people with loud cell phones. <laughs> 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 well, man, I was thinking that we have the um, word love, we have affectionate, infatuated, um, fond, so we have other words for love also. Well, so the love in terms of love as, as sex was one word in Greek, aroas. Then you had brotherly kindness. The love that you have for a family member, that was a different type of love. The love that you would have for a friend was another form of love. And, and it was, it was actually, all just one word. Yeah, and it was actually more, well, it all translates for us to love. to love. But in the Greek, it's actually the same root word, and all that changes is a little bit of a prefix or suffix. Mm -hmm. And just and, and, it, and a couple times it's just a little little dash mark. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only difference. And that's what makes it so. I mean, we really don't have a term for the idea of sacrificial love. Mm -hmm. That where you as a person, you are willing to die for anyone cool. in the in whole the world. world. <laughs> even not even, anyone, even the horrible <laughs> drug dealer. You know, so they thing. do, looking at this sample here, there are these words always have a lot of little marks. We don't have a lot of marks. Like Spanish, right. I know, has that little thing over right. it. They have the little, yeah. Yeah, the little squiggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like that. Yeah. Whatever it is. It plus the fact that they read it from uh, right to left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's Hebrew. Well, that's through that part. Yeah, the neat yeah. thing about, here's, here, so, I'll just end on this, and this I meant to bring up and I forgot. Look at C there on fruitfulness, abiding in Christ, abide. That word abide in the Greek 
Mennonite. Guess what, what word, English word, we get from Mennonite? Marinade? Marinette. Yeah, marinade. <laughs> so doesn't, doesn't that just make a neat way of abiding, yeah, this really idea of soaking up? Soaking up. Yeah. That, that word abiding means like we're a, a juicy steak sitting in marinade sauce, soaking it all up so that the flavor goes all through us. But I can understand that because that happens when you meditate on this word. Mm -hmm. You soak it up like yeah. you know, yeah. like so, a steak soaking Yeah, and that, that really you know? makes a whole different idea of this abiding. And that really, the whole goal of all disciples is this idea of fruitfulness. And then you really get into things, because what's fruitful? Fruitful, the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Gee, that's totally different than, gee, to be fruitful, we'll have 200 people in church. Is somebody that is fruitful. To be fruitful, we'll go do a bunch of stuff. Hmm. I didn't see that in the fruit of the spirit. <laughs> Just say. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'll see you all. Remember, no Bible study now until after Easter. Uh, yep, we got the Lenten services and everything like that. Some of the Latin services will be online. I'm not sure if they'll all be online, but some will be. Okay. All right.